All right, Luke uh, chapter 22 this morning, Luke chapter 22. We do want to thank the Lord for a real blessing yesterday, a good day. Uh, of course, the devil's going to fight uh, <clears throat> when uh, the uh, people of God get into his territory a little bit, um, but we want to praise the Lord. I was blessed yesterday after church to have a couple of my little guys, little fourth graders, come up to me with the... Uh, with the follow-up track that we give the kids in children's ministries uh, after they've come forward and someone's dealt with them about salvation. So uh, really happy to have two, two young guys, two little guys, come up and tell me how that they trusted the Lord as their Savior yesterday in that class. So I'm thankful. I know there's four or five of you that are uh, workers in that junior church and um, thankful for those that uh, take those ministries seriously. Yet you come to uh, you come to Sunday one of two ways, winging it, or prayed up and and walking with the Lord. One of those two ways every single Sunday. That's uh, how you went to church yesterday. That's how I went to church yesterday. That's how you'll go this next week, uh, and you'll come out of it on the end looking back. And no one else might know which way you went there, but there's definitely two people that do. There's the Lord. And, of course, that other person that we all know too well, ourselves. We know how we approached this past week. So, um, praise the Lord that his gospel went forth and that uh, people were saved. Pray for the follow-up this week from that. Uh, We'd uh, love to see everyone take the next step. We know the devil's going to be fighting the next step just like he fights the first step. Right? He'll fight every step along the way. Uh, and that's how he, he operates, um, because he hates everything about God. He hates everything about godliness. He hates everything about uh, church, uh, that is, following uh, the Bible. He hates all of that, and he's going to do all he can to stop it. He's going to try to stop God's word from going forth. And short of that, he's going to try to stop God's word from making its way into a heart. He'll st- try that today. He'll try that every chapel. He'll try to get all of us to be maybe looking up front, but let our mind be somewhere else. He's good with that. And again, there's only two people that know that. Okay, that's that's God and you. So every time that we have an opportunity to open the scriptures or to hear it spoken, it's kind of a little bit of a test for us. And uh, we'll come out of that with um, uh, closer to the Lord or uh, one of those long list of things that we don't like to talk about, but unfortunately they kind of haunt us, and that's that list of missed opportunities. And we don't, we don't want that, okay? The opportunities that the Lord has for us, uh, whether it be serving, um, whether it be a passing uh, a test of faith, or whether it be uh, passing the test of prayer in our life, we don't want those opportunities to pass by. That's the Actually, the three points for uh, today's message taken from Luke chapter 22, uh, this is three lessons for every disciple. Three lessons for every disciple. They all come from here in Luke chapter 22. Now, by the time we get to Luke chapter 22, the crowds following the Lord have shrunk down a lot. Okay? The year of popularity is ancient history. Uh, people that were there because of the food they were getting or the benefits they were getting or just strictly to be healed, uh, they've made their way back to their regular life. Sad, but they've, they've turned their back on the Lord in that sense. And so now we've, the, the people that are with the, Jesus, it's the, the crowd's much smaller. Really, this is his disciples. Okay, these are people that have, they've stayed with him. They've not gone back to their previous employment. Matthew's not gone back to collecting taxes, and, and uh, Peter and Andrew, they're still with the Lord. They haven't gone back to, to fishing, and uh, all the other disciples, they're still with him. Um, so it, it really is what we might say the Lord's best group, most promising group, is who this chapter is talking to. He's talking uh, to this group, and um, I like to compare it somewhat to those of you that, that are here, because um, those that made a decision to come to Bible college, you've made a decision to do that. Okay, that, that, took a, that took some level of faith. 
Uh, it takes an investment, as we talk about in time and, and in finances. You've, you've stepped out. All right, so uh, in that group, it's not huge, okay? This doesn't mean that those that are not at Bible college are out of the Lord's will. Don't, don't take it that way. But I'm just pointing out here that, that those that are here, you, you've made an effort to be here. You, you, you're, you're, you're in a place where, you, you know, your schedule's going to be different because you're, tr- you're trying to learn the Bible or you want to follow what you believe the Lord might have for you in your life. And so just like by Luke 22, the crowds have kind of come down to, to, to specific followers of Jesus, um, I see a parallel uh, here by having the opportunity to speak with uh, you here uh, today in a similar vein. And yet, despite the fact that these disciples had followed the Lord, um, there was still some lessons for them too. Okay, so um, that's where we come in. Despite we could say we've all followed the Lord in, 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 a, in an extra step of faith, okay, there's still some lessons for us today too. And that's the lessons I trust we will see here as we look at Luke chapter 22 this morning. Three lessons for every disciple. Thank you, Lord, for this time to look into the Bible. We thank you for it. Uh, Lord, um, again and again, it's a privilege to have these opportunities to study your word and, uh, Lord, to um, submit to it, surrender to it. Um, And I pray, God, that that would be the case today as uh, you really give some personal um, lessons that you teach in close proximity. These aren't really sermons that are preached to big crowds. These are just personal exhortations to a small group of people that are around you. And uh, Lord, I I pray that that would come across this way in today's message. And uh, Lord, that uh, those that are here uh, that have uh, come willing to learn and listen might be able to receive your word and, and see it really bring forth fruit uh, in, in their lives. We thank you, God, for, uh, again, the wonderful blessing uh, that, we, that we had yesterday, and ask God that you would be at work again uh, as we seek to bring uh, the loss to you and see, uh, Lord, Christians strengthened this next Sunday as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, Luke chapter 22, and uh, let's read verse 24 through 30 for point number one. The Bible says, And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he, Jesus, said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called uh, called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat? That's what most would say, all right? Most would say those that are sitting at the table are more important than those serving the food to those that are sitting at the table. If you like to mark your Bibles up, which I maybe am a little um, over the top on that, I constantly do, Um, but I circled and underlined and actually highlighted all the remaining words of this verse because when I meditated on it uh, a few years ago, it really hit me hard to see Jesus Christ used these words uh, in the presence of his little group of disciples here. So here are the words. But I am among you. I dwell among you. I'm existing. My, my, my state of being among you. I am among you as he that serveth. He proved that. Um, at this time, when there was a meal to be eaten among this group, 
And um, Jesus <clears throat> did, I mean, even more menial work than serve the meal. I mean, yeah, it's kind of a skill to be the person that, uh, you know, makes the food and serves it. That, that's, that's, that's serving, but that's not the end of the world. The end of the world is what happened when the guests came into the room from walking outside in this culture. And that is the shoes went by the door. And um, you learn that, uh, you know, some houses here, right, you visit somebody's house, they're like, do my shoes go on or off? That's the first question you've got to ask because you don't want to be the knucklehead who's traipsing around in, you know, work boots inside of this lady's house that's filled with white carpet. So you ask, shoes on or off? And if you have to question it, if you don't know what's always best to do, uh, here's a manners lesson, uh, it's best to just take your shoes off. Some cultures, this is not even a question. So <laughs> in uh, a couple, a um, year and a half ago, uh, over in, we were over in Myanmar, and uh, so uh, <clears throat> there's a zillion of these um, Buddhist shrines, places where you can go and worship, um, and uh, they're, they're kind of open air, so th there's openings for the doors and windows, but, you know, any bird that wants to is flying through there, and, and you can tell on the floor that the birds have been flying through there, okay, which really makes it pretty disgusting in our mindset because you have to take the shoes off before you go in and then you're walking in that both shoes and feet very dirty and many many societies many uh, countries in uh, southeast asia and even in africa if you walk down the road many people don't have any shoes at all fairly common they're sharing the road with animals you can imagine so if you're going to go in and have a nice meal well, the shoes have to come off, and, and the feet, if they're not washed, it's going to be fairly disgusting. Okay, so that's the job for the guy. Who makes the minimum wage here? Okay, your job is to take care of the shoes and the feet before they come inside. I mean, honestly, that's the minimum wage job, right? Not even like, hey, we'll start you at 10 bucks an hour. No, like 725 is that the minimum wage now? Like the lowest of the low, because that's the most disgusting job that there could be. I mean, I'd rather cook. I'd rather serve the table. I'd rather be sitting at the table. I don't want that job. Well, Jesus said, I am among you as he that serveth. He's not just talking about serving the food. He's talking about doing what the lowest of the low servant did, and that's meet him at the door where the shoes came off, and he had to kneel down with a basin of water Whew, one by one, wash 24 ugly feet, filthy feet. And Jesus said, I am among you as he that serveth. When I thought on that, I circled all those words. I underlined them, and I highlighted them, and I wrote them at the bottom of my Bible, quote, I am among you as he that serveth, unquote, dash, Jesus. Interesting. Do you remember what Jesus said about the servant and his Lord at another time? The servant's not greater than his Lord. Is Jesus our Lord? If you're saved, hopefully the Lord Jesus Christ rings a bell in your mind. The servant is not greater than his Lord. Well, okay, suddenly there's a test even for the small group of disciples. And they have to say, well, okay, I'm not sure if I'm up for that. I'm not sure if I'm up for that. They were just a little bit ago arguing, arguing um, about who's the greatest going to be. And Jesus told them, but they had to decide what they were going to do with that. They had to decide if, oh, I didn't know you meant that. Well, that's the Lord's test. What I love about the Lord is that when someone begins to follow him, He's not going to all of a sudden make life like this magical fairy tale. Okay? He's going to start the process of small tests in day-to-day -day life that are a test of our attitude towards serving. You'll get them, I'll get them, and what we do with them will determine 
where we end up in our life for the Lord. Jesus wants his disciples to learn this lesson. Verse 28, he encourages them. He know, they know this, verse 28, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. He said, I've been tried and tested, and you've been with me. Okay? He could have said, hey, you know what? You've stuck with me. That's enough. But he wanted more. He wanted the next step. He wanted service, the spirit of the servant. And so he said, I'm among you as he that serveth. Verse 29, there's a bright day ahead, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Well, this is coming. This is kind of the end times we're talking about here. Jesus said there's a kingdom coming. You are going to eat and drink at my table. Not only that, you're going to sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's a bright future. The future for the believer is unbelievable. However, right now, while we're on this earth, the Lord says, I'm among you as he that serveth. He that is chief, verse 26, is the one that serves. And so, lesson number one for every disciple from Luke 22, verses 24 through 30, Jesus tests us with our actions toward others, with the test of service, the lesson of service. Turn, uh, keep your finger there, turn to Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. Matthew 20, 25. Similar passage, parallel passage. The Bible says, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. That's the way the Gentiles operate their um, uh, their, their society there, okay? Verse 26, but it shall not be so among you. It's going to be different. He said, in the church, in the churches, in Christianity, it's different. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto you, now, Jesus could have set up a booth by the side of the road and said, come, any, come one, come all, serve me. Here I am, I'm the King of kings, Lord of lords, come serve me. He could have set up a palace. And he could have said, welcome, anyone that's here is welcome to come serve me. And, but he didn't do that. And the Bible says in verse 28, he came not to be ministered unto, unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Peter learned that eventually, when he talked about uh, uh, being an example to the flock, not being lords over God's heritage in, in, uh, the, in the epistles that he wrote after the Lord had ascended to heaven. Lesson number one for every disciple, the test are your actions toward others, the test of serving. Number two, back to Luke chapter 22, in verse 31. Acts twenty two thirty one. 31, the Bible says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. The second lesson for every disciple, particularly here for Peter, was the lesson of sifting. Lesson of sifting. This is your understanding of yourself. See, Peter got to the place. He had left his livelihood. He would left, in his mind, all. And the Lord said, yes, but Satan's not done with you. Because you have stepped out on faith, and taking this step does not mean Satan's through with you. He still has a plan for you, and that plan for you involves sifting you as wheat. The Bible here uses the word sifting, um, and uh, there's other terms for this personal trial or struggle that we might go through sometimes in our Christian life. 
Here, the Bible says Satan wants to sift you. The Lord, other places in the Bible, talks about his desire to purge us. Okay, to purge us. So purging has the idea of applying heat uh, to something so that that which is non-valuable okay, uh, is burnt up or goes away. Okay, refining, a metal goes to the refiner's fire so that the metal could come out pure and the, the dross is uh, thrown away. Uh, the Bible uh, it talks about uh, a branch and a vine and the fact that sometimes uh, there is a branch that's uh, unfruitful. And so the um, keeper of the vineyard is going to come along. He's going to trim little pieces off, that, off of that branch so that it can be more fruitful and bear more fruit. John chapter 15. So the Lord's purpose in sifting, uh, in, 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 um, in refining and purging is to see what is useless or vain or empty, burn up or be thrown away, and what is left is what is valuable. Satan's the great counterfeiter, the great mimicker, and so he has the similar process that he puts you and I through as well. But just as is always the case with him, his purposes are exactly the opposite of the purposes of, of the Lord. So here, the Bible says, Jesus says to Peter, Satan wants you, he wants to sift you as wheat. So here's what that's like. He wants to put you through this test, this fire, this whatever, so that he can keep from you what's valuable, steal it from you, and leave you only with the dross or the dead branch or what is useless or vain. So Satan has a sifting plan just like the Lord does. That's one of the big lies of Satan, is that if you follow the ways of the world, life's always just going to be A, good, and B, easier. No, it's very clear. The Lord has a plan for your life and for my life that involves purging, and uh, it involves refining. He wants to take away those things that would hinder our joy in our Christian life and the things that make life and eternity worth living. And Satan has a plan too. And he wants to take those things that make life worth living and he wants to keep them for himself and give you what is vain and what is empty. We have this as a real live object lesson throughout all of nature. Turn, if you would, keep your finger there, turn to Luke chapter 15. Nature gives us this object lesson over and over again. One of the object lessons that we can see this, Satan's sifting at work again. It's the counterfeit to the Lord's refining and the Lord's purging. So Satan's counterfeit uh, was believed by a young man one day who um, got the uh, <clears throat> swallow the lie of the devil. In verse 13 of Luke chapter 15, uh, many days, many after, the younger son gathered all together okay, and took his journey into far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. That's, that's the devil's way, fun. You know, it was fun. I'm sure it was glamorous. He was away from dad, so it was, he thought he was really living it up. He didn't have to, you know, clean his room. He didn't have to tell dad when he was going to be home at night. Dad wasn't watching over his finances. He had everything. He had money. He had his freedom. He had his full schedule. He had, he had it all. But he had the devil's counterfeit. Because the whole time that he went out for this riotous living, he was going to be his own guy, okay, the devil was working his plan. The devil had a perfect plan for this guy. And he was to slowly take away from this young man the things that were of most value and to leave him with just the shell of what he was promised. And so 
he goes. And uh, see, I don't know that him losing the money was the ultimate goal of the devil, Satan, when he's working this plan. I think that that was, that was, that was the, uh, the fruit of it. But I think the root of it was for this young man to go out and think that I don't need that right relationship with my dad in this story, the story of the, the lost son. I don't need that right relationship. I'm okay without that. I'm okay without that right relationship with my God. I'm okay without that. So the devil is slowly pulling out of this naive, deceived young man the things of greatest value in his life. And he's leaving him for a time with that money and the riotous living, undoubtedly included drunkenness and immorality and just this freedom in this world. The devil's got him. He thinks he's in charge, when in reality, he's playing into the devil's sifting. The devil's taking the good stuff. He's going to leave him a little bit, a little bit less, a little bit less, until we find in verse 15 all that's left for this young man in verse 16, verse 16, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks. What's a husk? Well, the husk is what we took off. Did you like the sweet corn there on Friday night there? Did you get that, some of that sweet corn from the Burex farm in southern part of Laporte, Indiana? Small farm, he grows that stuff. Man, it's so good. Uh, my wife and I got to go to Alaska this summer, and we met up there uh, with a couple who the military had put in there, but they're from southern Indiana, and they said, we miss the Indiana sweet corn. So someone else was going back up there after we were there, and we bought them a dozen ears and sent that back to Alaska. Boy, they sent back the nicest note. That was like going back in time. That was so good. I promise you what they did not do was to take the husks off that corn, to set the corn on the cob aside, and just start noshing on those husks. Man, this is, this is what... They bit a little chewy. Get some water to rinse the husks down. It's a little, but this is really, really good. This is what we missed. No, they didn't miss the husks. I can about promise you what they did with those husks. They threw them away. Got rid of them because they're they're just the shell. They're just the outside. They're worthless. They they wanted to get to the to that sweet corn. Well, this young man who felt that freedom soon enough realized that the devil had stolen from him what was of value and left him with what was vain or empty or worthless, husks. And so back here to Luke chapter 22, the Bible says, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. He wants your best He's not going to tell you that, Satan. He's not going to tell you that. You've got to thank the Lord for those that tell you sometimes things you don't want to hear. Thank the Lord for them. Thank the Lord for them. Satan's not going to tell you this. He's going to, he's going to paint the picture. And uh, a lot of guys looked at the picture. And on the other side of that picture, they're living with the most empty, worthless, vain things with regard to Christianity, with regard to God, and with regard to eternity. There's nothing there. Nature's filled with these uh, illustrations. I got two more. I got two more up here. All right, so let me reach under here. We got, we got an orange. Okay, there we got an orange. Whenever our family has oranges, my wife's always like, can you get it started for me? Can, can you get it started for me? I'm like, is, you know, okay, all right. So sometimes the fingernail might work, and sometimes I just do, you know. <gasps> it's, it's an orange. <laughs> okay, I put hand sanitizer all over it, so it's not going to have any diseases. No one's going to talk to me the rest of the day. <laughs> so then, you, you, you know, I, I didn't bite it. 
and swallow it. Yeah, I don't want that, do I? Do I, do I want that? N- not really. I hope maybe you do. You know, you always <laughs> sit beside, oh man, school. You know, you, you always have Joe, Joe Weirdo <laughs> that you have to sit beside in the lunchroom growing up. And, you know, so he's out there peeling his orange, you know, and then, you know, he's saving the peels, and at the end of the end of lunch, he'll start eating them. You're like, that, that is disgusting. <laughs> but what's he going to do? No, man, that's where all the vitamins are at. That's the healthy stuff. That I mean, that's where you got to be eating that stuff right there. This other stuff, it's just, it's okay, but that's where, the, that's where it's really at right there in, in the in the rind of the, of, the, of the orange. So everybody kind of just scoots their chair aside a little bit and lets Joe Weirdo over there talk about the health benefits of the orange rind and how that, that's where, you know, the nutrients truly lie. Well, Joe Weirdo aside, most of us are going to peel that orange, and this stuff here is going to get thrown in the garbage, because this is like the husk of the corn, the cob. We're not, we're not eating this. This is vain. This is empty. This is worthless. And I know there's two or three people in here I'm totally offending by saying that. You can dry that and grind it into a powder and then you can pour it in. It, it, it just, okay. I will collect all of mine for the rest of the life and you can op- open your orange rind dehydration business and, and get rich. Okay. Okay. And he's the same guy that's going to look at a banana like this and say, mmm, and just start eating it. Oh. Right? right. Because, why? I've been telling you. The bana- banana peel... <laughs> that's it. That's that is delicious. We love the banana peel. I mean, mm, you can open that up and just think. You got the good. You got this stuff inside. It's okay, but this is filling, fiber, healthy. I mean, who needs vitamins? Who needs vaccines when you got a banana peel? There it is. Okay. So the next time that the devil comes along and says, hey, got some fun living for you. Remember the orange rind? Remember the husk of the corn? Realize that he wants to sift you. He does. And he's going to give you that. And he's going to take that from you. Whereas the Lord says, I got, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put you through a little bit of fire here. I'm going to put you through a test here. Because I want to get rid of this out of your life. And and I want to give you that. That's what I want to leave with you. Now, that is a test that even goes to disciples. You say, well, I've already passed that test. Going to be more tests. Okay? The devil's not done with you or I. He wants to sift you. And so, lesson number two for every disciple is the lesson of sifting, where we must understand our, ourselves. Lesson three, back to Luke chapter 22, verse 37. Uh, for the sake of time, let's go to verse 39. And he came out and went, and as he was wont, or as he, was his habit, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him, and When he was at the place, I like that, he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that you enter not into temptation. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood, Falling down to the ground. He rose from prayer, was come to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. Found them sleeping. The third test 
The lesson for every disciple is the lesson of supplication. This is your attitude toward God. Supplication. Peter was very confident there in verse 33. In his conversation with others, very confident. I am following God. Lord, I'm following you to the very end. But his lesson he had to learn was that battle would be won not in conversation with others, but in his private, personal supplication with God. The real lesson, the test of discipleship, is in our personal times of prayer with the Lord. That's the test. That's the lesson. Even these men, they'd been taught to pray. They asked the Lord, teach us to pray. They listened to lessons on prayer. You and I, we've listened to lessons on prayer. We've heard sermons on prayer. We did this and that. We can probably give you the acrostic, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. We probably could, you know, go on and on about the illustrations about prayer and this and this and this and this. But when it came time to pray, to pray by themselves, they were found sleeping. So this test... The test of supplication, our attitude toward God, will certainly be something that uh, makes or breaks our future as disciples. So in Luke chapter 22, three lessons for every disciple. Number one is the lesson of serving. What's your attitude towards serving? Is your attitude towards serving the same as the attitude of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who said, quote, I am among you as he that serveth. Your actions towards others will reveal this. Number two, what's your understanding of yourself? This lesson of sifting. Never forget, God's got a plan for you. He wants to take the dross, the dead away and uh, produce a vessel for the finer. Produce a pure uh, 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 a, 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 a pure, get a pure result from this by taking away the things that would hinder us. The devil wants to take out what's valuable and leave you with this just the husks, the rinds, the peels, just stuff that otherwise would be thrown away. And number three, the lesson of supplication, your attitude toward God. When it come ta- comes time to actually pray, not, not to take notes on it, not to think about it, not to hear a lesson on it, but to actually pray. Time to actually pray. The Garden of Gethsemane, it's time to actually pray. How you doing? It's a lesson for every disciple. Serving, sifting, and supplication. Thank you, Lord, for this time.